Hi, everyone. I'm Tom. Um, guess what I don't build? Wireless networks. <laughs> um, thank you all for having me back here as part of your community. Um, I did a talk a couple years ago at WLPC about um, community, and Keith and I decided uh, maybe we needed to make it a little bit longer. So I have a 30-minute session that teaches you how to build a community. Because I, last time I talked about harnessing the power of it, and then I realized I kind of forgot to give you guys some tips on how to build one. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I'm a huge fan of LEGO. I think most of you guys are huge fans of LEGO, right? I think there was a LEGO building contest last night. Congratulations to the winners. Um, I think about community a lot like a Lego set. There's a bunch of standardized pieces that all fit together, and they help you build things in a way that prevents you from doing things you're not supposed to, like gluing your fingers together. I do that all the time. So I break this down into three different distinct areas. We start our community build, putting things together, getting your community going, growing your community, which is typically the part where a lot of people have some challenges, and then what you do with your community after you've already built it and it's mature. So the most important question that you're probably asking yourselves right now is, why should I listen to anything that Tom has to say? Well, <laughs> for a while now, I've been involved in several communities. This is a picture of people at Cisco Live in 2011. As a matter of fact, there are several people in this picture that are in this room right now. This was before Cisco figured out what Twitter was. This was before Cisco had the social media hub and contests and hashtags and things like that. This was the genesis of something that the community, for whatever reason, calls Tom's Corner, where we got together to do social things together. There are 24 people in this picture. I'll tell you that the person who's all the way over on the left in the yellow shirt, to this day, no one's been able to identify that person, so if you know who he is, please let me know. <laughs> but this community has grown enormously over the last almost 10 years. But that's not the only way that I do community building. I also do this thing called Tech Field Day. Is there anybody in this room who does not know what Tech Field Day is? Okay, maybe like two people. Come see me after this is over with. Community is my job now. So I like to joke that Tech Field Day is my Bruce Wayne job. I like to go around and talk to people. At night, I dress up like Batman and I make fun of vendors on my blog. <laughs> this is where I have all of my experience from the community. But what are we talking about? Who is this really for? So this is people who see themselves as a leader in their community. And there are a lot of folks out here who are. Um, Jin is a perfectly good example of someone who saw a need for a new community of people to do yoga at conferences, and she took the bull by the horns and ran with it. And she has people who are members of her community. I will be one tomorrow. God help me, I'm gonna do yoga. This could be fun. It's for people that wanna expand their interests. I always had this idea that I wanted to do 3D printing, but I had no idea what I was doing until I worked with Robert two years ago and built my own 3D printer. And now I can do it, and I'm very happy about that. But I'll tell you who, what this is not. This is not a roadmap on how to build your own company influencer community. Because I promise you, my ideas are not the way you want to go about this if you're doing this for a living. Why? Huge mileage may vary. This is my story, my ideas. These might not work for you. In fact, I can guarantee you at least three or four of them absolutely will not work for you because they barely worked for me. Take this with a grain of salt and use these as a building block because I promise you, you will find very quickly that some of these things work better than others. In fact, if I had to do it all over again, I know for a fact that I would change some of the things that I did. So let's start off. How do we build things? How do we start building things? Well, that's really easy. Let's go find the instruction booklet. It's the one thing I find casually discarded across the room whenever my kids open a Lego set. And I'm like, no, 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 we need to read this. But if you ever flipped over the back of a Lego set, or at least the old ones before they were all licensed, and there's like four or five really cool things that you can build, like you can turn a rocket ship into a car or a train, there's no instructions for that, right? Big fans of the Lego movie, like me, master builders, do they have to read instructions? No, they don't, they just feel their way through things. That's kind of how community is. Think of this like the guidelines. This is the instruction manual for suggestions. I'm gonna tell you the biggest thing that people get wrong about community every time. It's work. It's a lot of work. Building your community takes time and effort, and if you think you're gonna get something out of a community easily, 
you are about to be very mistaken. You have to invest blood, sweat, toil, and tears. We'll talk a little bit about those things in just a minute. But you have to play a long game with community. You have to be ready to be patient. And if anybody's ever met me, you know patience is not one of my virtues. So you need to be ready to do the work. Fred the Baker, anybody time to make the donuts? This is how I feel most of the time I go to conferences. You have to show up every day to make a community happen. Cisco Live 2011, the community didn't happen because I popped my head in a door on a Tuesday morning and said, hey guys, what's up? I parked my butt in an uncomfortable bistro chair for six hours a day on the weekends, and I said, come find me. I want to meet you. I want to talk to you. I want to know who these people are. That was one year removed from what was the first tweet up at Cisco Live, which was, according to the video I found from Patrick Swackhammer, about 30 people looking extremely uncomfortable crammed into a presentation room somewhere in the Mandalay Bay. You have to make that community happen. You have to put the time in. People always ask me, especially when I first started doing this for a living, so what else do you do besides Tech Field Day? And my response was always, I don't have time for anything else. Field Day community building is a year-round thing. You plan for things that happen in the fall. You look at things that happened a year ago. You're always trying to plan out for things. You have to be there. You have to make the donuts. You don't want to, but you have to. It also means that you have to be there. It's not enough to show up, you have to be present. You don't get to take a pass on building a community by walking into a room and just hanging out. Tech field day events are on average 16 hours for me. I wake up at six-ish in the morning, I go to bed around midnight, I'm exhausted. I get home and I crawl into a cave for like a day and I don't talk to anybody. Why? It takes a lot of effort. Cisco Live is like that too. My wife went to Cisco Live with me for the first time in 2016. We showed up on Sunday, we flew in, we did the tweet up, we did dinner, we did all the stuff, we went back to the hotel room, she collapsed on the bed. And she goes, wow, I never knew how hard this was. And I looked at her and said, honey, it's nine o'clock. If you weren't here, I'd already be out hanging out with people for another two, three hours. It's work. It's rewarding work. I mean, I walked in that front door today and I couldn't make it to this room because of all the people that were saying hi to me and I really genuinely appreciate that. And I'm still surprised that you guys even wanna be seen with me. But it means that you have to shake everybody's hand and if you miss someone like May, you have to go back and shake her hand again. Hi, May. It also means being available. A lot of you guys in here have texted me at odd hours. A lot of you folks in here have emailed me on the weekends or made a phone call to me, because I told you I'll be there if you need me. And it means that sometimes you're like, do I really wanna answer this? Hey, what's up? If you're not available, somebody else will be. If you wanna be seen as a leader in your community, you need to be there. Sometimes it means having not fun conversations with people. Sometimes it means finding out someone important to them has passed away. And you have to be there for that person. You have to show empathy, you have to be ready to be available. But what's the payoff? Nine years ago, I had no idea that Cisco Live was gonna be as big as it is now. This quote is something that I use in a community that I'm involved in outside of technology with the Boy Scouts called Wood Badge, where we train leaders. People who plant trees knowing they will never sit under their shade have figured out the meaning of life. How many of you guys have ever seen a picture of the King's Cathedral at Cambridge? If you ever watch like the, the uh, BBC Christmas services, that's where they sing. It's beautiful, it was built in the 1600s. It has this vaulted ceiling made out of oak timbers. It's absolutely gorgeous. When they built that in the 1600s, there were a lot of trees in England, right? I mean, the Industrial Revolution hadn't happened yet. Well, years ago, those timbers started rotting and falling apart. And the architects of the cathedral said, we've got to go find some oak to replace the timbers that are in there. Where are we gonna find it? There are no more trees in England, we cut them all down for the Industrial Revolution. And the groundskeepers at Cambridge said, yeah, there are trees right out the back. Turns out, behind the cathedral are a whole bunch of old growth oak trees. Why is that? The architects of the cathedral in 1600 realized that someday 
those beams would need to be replaced. So they planted a whole bunch of acorns so that 300 years from now, we could have trees. That's vision. That's what we teach the leaders in my course. Vision isn't something you always know about. You have to be willing to take a chance on that. This one's hard for me. You have to be willing to listen to people. When I started at Tech Field Day, the first thing that my boss, Mr. Stephen Foskett, who's a lovely human being, hi boss, um, told me is that I gotta learn to shut up. That's hard for me. I have to listen. Tell me your story. Tell me about who you are. Tell me why you came into Wi-Fi. You learn a lot when you listen. And not just like when I'm on a conference call. <sighs> okay, wait for my name to be called. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm listening, I'm listening. You have to pay attention, active listening. That's how I know that Jen likes yoga. Even before Jen told everybody she likes yoga. It's how I know Robert likes 3D printers or Lee likes to take pictures of his backyard with a giant flying drone. You can learn a lot from people by paying attention. You have to listen three times more than you talk. And you need to learn to ask really good questions that can't be answered with yes or no. That's how you build a community. You get people talking. What's the reward that you're gonna get out of com your community? If your answer is I wanna be rich and famous, I got some bad news for you. You don't get rich and famous by building a community. I, one time somebody asked me, how do you become a rich and famous blogger? And I said, it's a three-step process. One, you become rich. Two, you become famous. And three, you start a blog. <laughs> it is not for the faint of heart. And believe it or not, some people don't find the reward in a community of being out in front. I have several friends who hate talking, who don't want to be in front of people. Their reward is seeing a successful community get built on the back end. Let them kind of sit in the back and do their thing. It's not always easy. Here's one way that you can get a massive reward out of your community. You have to give, but not just give like, you know, here's five bucks. You have to give with absolutely no expectation of getting any reward out of it. It's the most genuine kind of giving. Because by giving yourself to something bigger than you, you will build something that lasts because it doesn't feel like you're trying to pull things out of it. How many times have we ever gone to a meeting? Uh, one of my, my favorite examples of this is the VMUG meetings. I go to a VMUG meeting, I'm almost positive that my information is going to end up on a mailing list somewhere, and I'm probably going to get a vendor presentation that I don't want to listen to. Because the VMUG says the only way to have community is to, to give something to other people that's of value to them. The value to me in a community is the people who are a part of it. And I give without reservation. I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be rich. I want to see people succeed and prosper and enjoy themselves and have fun. That's how you build a community. It's easy. You show up, you put the effort in, you find a way to get a reward out of it that's not dollar bills, y'all. But how do you grow a community? This is actually kind of hard. Well, Shia will tell you that you just gotta do it. Uh, sorry, there was a GIF that had flames on it, but I decided that was a little too much for this one. Um, you have to do something. You can't just sit there. You can't just hope community's gonna happen and sprout up over in the corner while you're doing something. I mean, think about the number of people that you know in a community that have started a podcast because of people that they met, that have started a video series, that have started anything. It's because they recognized that there was a need and they did something with it. You've got to be ready to move and change and do things. Because if you sit still, it's like how many of you folks in here are runners or do workouts? What's the hardest part of starting your workout? Getting off the couch. You have to do, you have to move. Once you're moving, the rest of it's easy, relatively speaking. Here's another way that you can get people to grow their community. Introductions. I'm gonna tell you a dirty little secret of field day. I listen a lot, but I also break up knots of conversations everywhere. When I see two people that know each other really well talking over here in the corner, you know what the first thing I do is? I go find somebody they don't know, and I'm like, come here, go talk to these people. Do you know why? Because you won't learn anything unless you're talking to people you don't already know. 
drag people over, make introductions. But here's the important thing. Once you've made an introduction, back up. Don't act like a gatekeeper. Don't be someone who is controlling the conversation. Let them figure out what they have in common. Sometimes that's hard for people. You know why? Because that means you build relationships with people. I mean, we're all Princess Bride fans in here. Fun fact, my job offer was my boss asking me if I wanted to become the Dread Pirate Roberts. Billy Crystal was an amazing part of that movie, right? And then everybody runs off for the finale. Have fun storming the castle, and we don't see him again. You build relationships with people, and those relationships can take off in ways you couldn't even possibly expect. Several people that I know have started their own podcasts. I'm proud of them. I'm happy for them. I'm not a part of them. I, I don't have time to be on a podcast. And yeah, sometimes I feel jealous. I'll admit it. Because two people that I introduced get along super famously. But you know what? At the end of the day, when I think about it, I really am happy. Because that connection might not have happened if I hadn't said anything. But at the same time, it's up to them to keep their relationship going and not me. I have other things to do, like break up not so conversation over here in the corner, like Billy Crystal. You also have to be an example in your community, and this one's hard. If your community is built around people that um, make inappropriate jokes and drink until four in the morning, if that's the example that you're sitting, setting, then your community is going to be making inappropriate jokes and drinking until four in the morning. And yeah, hey, I'll be the first person to mea culpa. Sometimes at field day, it gets a little rowdy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, I am. Um, because that's not the kind of community that we want to build. We want to build an inclusive community where people get to have fun. So, that means sometimes going, guys, that's a really inappropriate joke. Let's not do that again. Or, hey, it's 10 o'clock and I'm really, I'm really tired. Maybe we need to go to bed. Doesn't always happen. Some people sometimes like to stay up and chit chat. It's totally okay. But by setting the example, maybe they don't do it this time. But maybe next time they'll say, probably need to turn in a little bit early. You know why it's important for you as a community leader to set the example? Because if you don't, somebody else will. How many times have we heard stories in the, in the news of people at conferences saying or doing something that cause massive problems or cause codes of conduct to be created or make people uncomfortable? They set the tone for the community, even if they are an outlier. Because if you don't do that, if you, if you let that happen, your community will judge everything based on what that person did. So you have to be willing to step up. How many of you guys in here have ever heard of an author named Brene Brown? Jennifer's hand went up because you introduced me to her. Brene Brown writes a lot of books on leadership, and I've been tearing through them at a mad pace on my airplane flights. And one of the things that Brene Brown talks about is trust in a community, specifically Ethan Banks. How many of you guys in here have talked to Ethan or have heard his voice on the Packet Pushers podcast? He did a great presentation with us a couple years ago about trust. That's the bedrock of the Packet Pushers community. If you don't feel comfortable in your community, you can never feel safe. You can never feel like you can open up and talk to people. And that means that you can't betray the trust that people have put in you. For example, Tech Field Day. I have a massive database of people's email addresses. I never share it with anybody else. You know why? Because you trusted me with that information. I'm not gonna sell it. I get asked to sell it all the time. Too bad, so sad, I'm not in this to get rich. I'm in this to protect your information. Brene's example for a trust is a marble jar. Every time you do something that's trustworthy, you put a marble in the jar. When you do something that's untrustworthy, you take a handful of marbles out. You can see how quickly that jar gets very empty very fast. Always be thinking about trust. How do you build trust? One of the ways that you can build trust is keeping people's confidences. In my job as a community organizer, I get phone calls all the time from people who are thinking about changing jobs or asking about companies that they want to go work for. And do you know how I counsel them? I give them advice, honest advice, and then I shut up. And I'm excited when they announce that they're going to a new company. And I'm thrilled for them. And I'll sing it from the rooftops as soon as they tell me that I can. But I'm not going to call people and be like, hey, guess where so-and-so's going? Because that's a betrayal of trust. And I don't want to do that. Because then people stop calling me. 
And I kind of like knowing these things. It's like a fun little secret. You have to keep those things in a vault. You have to lock them away. This one's actually really hard too. Judgment. How many of you guys in here know Denise Fishburne? She's a Cisco CPOC employee. Uh, she wears the pink hat at conferences. I love Fish to death. She's a great human being, and every time I see her, she runs up and she gives me a giant hug. Fish was not originally a part of our community. She didn't join until 2014. Do you know why? She was afraid that everyone in networking was gonna judge her, was gonna tell her that she didn't know what she was talking about. She was scared to death. She's one of the smartest human beings that I know. Do you know how she finally got to a point where she felt comfortable coming in here? That redheaded woman right back there, Amy Arnold, finally took her by the hand and said, come with me, they won't judge you. Yeah, she deserves a round of applause for that. It's hard because judgment is, is a shortcut for learning for most of us. It's like, ah, if I judge this person, I don't have to think about this anymore. I don't have a lot of energy as it is, so it's really easy for me to go, eh, don't care. I live in fear of judgment. Like, I was sitting back there on the verge of hyperventilating, even though I do this all the time, because I'm maybe like, they're, they're not gonna believe me, they're not gonna know what I'm talking about. It's hard, you have to swallow it down and you have to get past it. Because judgment overall causes problems. It reduces discussion. You have to embrace new ideas. This is something I talked about at the last one. You have to be willing to talk to people who do not agree with you. You have to be willing to embrace new ideas you didn't think were possible. Devin's in here somewhere. 2.4 is dead, right? Still? Are we still doing dead? Except it's not. I'll listen to Devin. Devin has some great ideas. I don't agree with Devin. IoT doesn't agree with Devin. But that's not my place. He still has a place in this community because he's valued, he's intelligent, and he knows what he's doing. If we both agree on everything that I'm talking about, someone's wasting their breath. So let's try to get around those ideas. Anybody in here ever have a pet goldfish when they were a kid? I did. Anybody in here ever have more than one pet goldfish as a kid? Fun fact about goldfish, they're a lot like potted plants. They will only grow as big as the bowl you put them in. And I know this because the one goldfish that I had that lived longer than two weeks, we kept moving it into a bigger tank and it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then one day I put it in a stock tank and I forgot about it. And that sucker lived for two more years and was the size of a trout when I got done with it. <laughs> House plants are the same way. If you put them in a little tiny pot, they never get very big. But if you put them outside, they grow. Communities are the same way. If you give them bounds, if you give them things to work in, they never get bigger than that. You have to give people space to grow and change and find their tribe. That's a term I keep hearing. And guess what? Sometimes you're gonna have to move things. My favorite analogy for this is the people who stand on top or get onto the top of a ladder and they sit down and they go, ah, I made it. And they look around at the view and they're like, this is so pretty. There's some of us that are looking down going, you know, if I stood on top of this ladder, I could probably reach up there and hang that AP. Some ideas need their own space. They need those people that are willing to stand on top of a ladder and go, let's do that thing over there. Be ready to do that. It's dangerous. Is there anybody in here from OSHA? Please don't look at this slide. <laughs> but it might mean that you get to create a new community. You get to seed people. All right, um, another thing that comes up quite often when people ask me about this, this is probably the most technical slide I have. Uh, what, what tools can I use to grow the community? And the answer is, you can't really use tools to grow a community. Um, someone very smart this week told me that you can't build a connection with someone over text message, or iMessage, or Slack, or Teams, or WhatsApp, or anything. Fun fact, several people who are at Cisco Live, um, we keep track of each other via iMessage. And then someone said, iMessage sucks, let's go to Slack. So we went to Slack, and they're like, well, Slack sucks, let's go to WhatsApp. So they went to WhatsApp, but one guy who doesn't want to use WhatsApp because he's afraid of Facebook didn't log in, so now we're back on iMessage. And if someone brings up Teams, I'm gonna scream. <laughs> Don't rely on tools to help you build your community, because if everybody stops using that tool, you won't have a community. At Field Day, I have about 15 different ways that I can reach people, and I use all of them. Email, Slack, uh, Skywriting, you name it, I'm gonna use it, because I wanna make sure that the message gets out there. All right, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna speed up here a little bit. What happens when your community matures? This is actually the hardest part for people like me. First of all, you have to be a really good steward. 
help out where you can, be a part of what you're doing, but realize that there may be a time when you have to step away. This has been happening to me more and more at Cisco Live as my Bruce Wayne job has taken over my Batman job. I spend more time at field day than I do with the community at the social media hub. I know soon it will be time for me to move on because other people have taken over that role and I'm totally cool with that. The picture earlier of Tyler Durden, the great philosopher, if you want to call him that, Fight Club has a really good message about people who create communities and then disappear into them. If you watch the movie or read the book, Tyler is a myth for a very long time because people don't see him. He's a part of the community. The people who are in the center are the community. They're the spotlight and the focus. Tyler's just some dude that flies around and starts fight clubs. It's just as important for you to be able to participate as it is for you to lead. You have to learn to follow. You also have to encourage others to step up. Men in Black is one of my favorite movies because at the very, very end, Tommy Lee Jones tells Will Smith that I wasn't training a partner, I was training a replacement. You have to recognize greatness in people and get them to step forward and take on new roles so that you can eventually fade into the distance. And I'll tell you why I know that in the bottom of my soul. Does anybody recognize the guy in the front of that picture? I'll give you a hint. It's me. This is 2013 in Cisco Live US in Orlando, Florida. This was the very first year that Cisco got it. They built that social media hub that you see in the background. We're gonna do hashtags and contests and social. I'm wearing a t-shirt that I created that every attendee was handed. It has my Twitter handle on it. If anything, this was my coronation as the leader of Cisco Live. Now I'm gonna show you a picture of Cisco Live US 2019. Does anybody know where I am in this picture? You were in this picture. I'll give you a hint. I'm in the back on the side. I really wanted to get every picture since 2013 and do like the Tom slowly migrating into the ocean picture because every year I have gotten further back and further to the side and more anonymous. Now Amy's up here. I'm gonna call you out, Amy. You're as much a part of this community and a leader as anybody else. I walked in to the social media hub and I saw Fish and David Penaloza and Amy and a whole bunch of really other awesome people holding court. And it was so lovely to just be able to sit and listen for once. And then they found me and they're like, hey, there's Tom. Tom, come say things. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to talk. Stephen went to Ray WS and reInvent two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. And he was talking to Corey Quinn. If you guys don't follow Corey Quinn on Twitter, his Twitter handle is Quinny Pig. He's awesome and he hates Larry Ellison as much as I do. But they were talking about community at AWS Serenity Event. This, this thing's 65,000 people. And Steven said, hey, Corey, where's the community? And he goes, well, the community's us. It's, it's, it's people. And he goes, yeah, 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 I know that. But where do you guys hang out? Like, where does everybody go? And some random person over on the side went, oh, you mean like Tom's Corner? Dude, it would be so awesome if we had one of those. He told me this and I almost fainted because I'm like, oh God, really? One day soon, you will build a community and it will be an awesome community and it will be amazing and filled with vibrant people. And you'll be sitting there and someone will come up and go, hey, did you ever hear about this thing called Tom's Corner? And you'll be like, yeah, I heard about it once. It's cool. All right, I'm way over time. If you want to come find me and ask any questions or share some stories, I'm always happy to do so. But thank you very much for letting me be a part of your community today.